that we have these conversations, lead these conversations, and also, um, you know, encourage men as well to engage in these conversations. And that's something that we've certainly been talking a lot about as organisers of the week about um, the role of um, men within the feminist agenda as well. So I will repost the Miria board here if people would like to add their ideas and continue to share. Um, and I will pass over to Amy to tell everyone a little bit more about um, the start of this talk. Cool, yeah. Um, so, um, as it says on the poster, um, the three of us were nominated for the Women in Property Student Award. Um, so I actually hadn't heard of the organisation Women in Property before this, so I'll give you a brief intro in case you haven't either. Um, so they are a multidisciplinary group um, and have members from a whole range of built environment careers. So from quantity surveyors to estate agents to architects and to engineers. Um, and that's just to name a few. Um, so it's all about women supporting each other in a male dominated industry. Um, and I'll just read to you their mission statement. So they say, we believe that success and its rewards should be founded on merit and expertise rather than gender. We actively seek an industry that is balanced, diverse and inclusive. So we nurture girls aspiring to a career in the built environment sector, as well as supporting those in mid career and at board level. So they um, strive to create opportunities to expand knowledge and inspire women in the property and construction industries. Um, and they do this through encouraging an exchange of ideas and sharing of expertise um, through various events, workshops, and also initiatives, um, including the National Student Awards, which the three of us were part of. Um, so Alison's gonna explain a bit about the process of that. Yeah, so in terms of the process, we just had like um, an interview with um, about five uh, women who are in the industry, but from different fields. So we had town planners, um, senior planners, um, sort of heads of communications of certain um, sort of property companies, um, and just to see an architect as well. Um, and they sort of asked us questions on our projects that we presented to them. Um, but the most, I think the most useful bit for me afterwards was when they just sort of discussed the industry and what it's like to work in the industry. And a lot of them had um, started perhaps like 20 years ago and to see the evolution since then, or perhaps slow, very slow <laughs> evolution since then in terms of uh, more diversity in it. Um, so that was just an interesting discussion to sort of have that link between education and industry. Um, Cause I think sometimes, um, although there's lots of efforts to do that, that can be missing a lot of the time and maybe that's where things fall short. So you might have a lot of uh, women, for example, in, in education uh, doing our degrees. And then when it actually comes to industry, there are far more barriers uh, that sort of come into it, which makes it still be very imbalanced. Um, and obviously, I think as we are all talking here, we're still talking as sort of white women. So we still have um, a degree of privilege as well and almost less barriers than others. And so it's also need to talk about sort of diversity, both with women, but also in terms of sort of more BME and um, just general diversity in the industry that is still very much needed. Um, I sort of went off on one there, but yeah. Um, guys, do you yeah. want to talk about your experience that you had as well? Yeah, that's good, I think that was one thing that they really you know picked up on I think and is what we're picking up on throughout the week as well in terms of inclusivity that was one of the key um topics of discussion in terms of you know you can't really talk about feminism without talking about inclusivity as well and picking up on what you mentioned um before Alison you know there there's a I think 47 percent female cohort within architectural education but then that drops off to um I think something to do something like um only 22 percent within um architectural industry so that implies that there's a massive drop off rate between architectural education to then women in 
you know, positions of, um, you know, decision making roles within architecture. Um, so of course, I definitely believe this kind of encouragement to form these links between industry and education is really important. And that's what Women in Prophecy was all about. And that's what I found really valuable. Um, I thought, I mean, me personally, I before the Women in Property interviews, I've never actually done an interview before, which is, um, yeah, kind of crazy, but it was a really valuable experience to talk to women from industries that I had never experienced before, didn't even know existed. Um, and I think, especially within architectural education, there can be quite a um, inward looking approach to the built environment and we often don't necessarily consider the you know hundreds of other roles that people play within designing our cities and buildings so I felt my perspectives as an architecture student were um became a lot more uh, broader in a sense in terms of really understanding um, what the built environment is all about um, and I think other industries within the built environment are an awful lot more um, segregated and male dominated than architecture I think when you can compare architecture to other industries like um, civil engineering, even architectural engineering that I'm sure Amy will talk about. Um, it certainly does give a bit more perspective um, into all of these things. So I don't know if Amy, you want to talk a bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, I can lead on from that. So yeah, it was just kind of a good experience for me to like be able to kind of reflect on my past experiences as um, a woman um in this sort of industry um or studying this degree even um so yeah so one of the things that um i kind of thought back to was when i'd been on a site visit for work experience and um they had um these like boots that you could borrow so you could be safe wearing them on site um and they didn't have any that was sort of like your typical female boot sizes um and yeah I ended up having to wear boots that were too big for me and I just felt a bit silly in that situation when um really you want to kind of be um that's definitely something that could have put me off um wanting to do this degree um so I do architecture and engineering um and yeah engineering more so than architecture is very male dominated so I think yeah I can see how people can be easily put off by that and yeah, it just kind of opens up that conversation of how do we make it um, kind of more inclusive and more appealing to younger women who like want to explore this um, sort of career. Like this was work experience I had in high school as well. So <laughs> at that point, like you don't know what you want to do. And yeah, so that's definitely something that would, um, yeah, sort of discourage you from that. And um, But yeah, it was interesting actually, because um as part of sort of the interview day you get welcomed into the zoom room by um the previous regional winner um so for us it was katie howarth um and she yeah she was really inspiring it was great to have a conversation with her because she had previously been a nurse for 10 years and then changed to doing um a degree in quantity surveying and yeah just kind of that real sort of like juxtaposition of um, when nursing is very female um, dominated to like the pretty much male um, dominated industry. So um, yeah, just kind of her experiences of that as well um, was really interesting to hear. Um, yeah, and then just kind of like more generally um, about sort of the interview um, for anyone who might be listening to this in the future, <laughs> if they've been like nominated, like um, it was just a very like, uh, everyone was very welcoming um, with the experience and yeah I think as Anna was saying like being able to kind of speak to these people for the first time from industries that yeah might not have heard of or didn't know existed um, amongst um, 
sort of the built industry um yeah it was just really like kind of eye-opening in that sense um yeah, yeah and i think a lot yeah sorry <laughs> and there's a lot of like stuff you do in architecture like school like teamwork and stuff to build up to when you're going to be working as a team in practice but at that point you're working with um just the people on your course you're not getting that kind of wider experience um of other kind of um uh other kind of like departments of work so yeah it was just a bit of like a nice eye opener a bit of an insight into the actual real working world so yeah sorry go on Anna <laughs> yeah I guess just to add to that like a broader sense of solidarity as well because I think I see my um kind of colleagues within the year as like um you know comrades in a sense but knowing that there's such a wider scope of people throughout the whole industry of all ages you know no matter what industry you come from as well there's a real sense of solidarity there and i think that's what the women in property um nominations gave me a real sense of i think um because obviously everything was online um this year normally it would be like an in-person um, kind of whole kind of weekend event where you go down to London and you know you meet all the other nominees as well I think um, that has the implications of COVID there definitely changed probably changed the experience but I think um, despite everything being online it certainly um, yeah it was certainly a, still like a really positive uplifting you know experience to meet lots of people <laughs> yeah can i just add to that um yeah i agree with what anna was saying there but i, I also <laughs> i was critical of things which isn't great but um i also think perhaps this opportunity could be um for everyone i think it's sort of to get this opportunity you shouldn't just you shouldn't have to be sort of nominated for something i think that link with industry whether that be from architecture but also like quantity surveying and sort of um planning and and industries that may be and engineering that are perhaps you know are way more male dominated i still think there needs to be a stronger sort of link between um sort of students and industry and also sort of from the start i think the whole sort of built environment as a general thing even though we live in it and like have embodied experiences in it that's the only way we get sort of that's our only knowledge of it and I think even like in primary or secondary school, perhaps built in like the built environment could be something that's more taught. And actually, in terms of the right to the city and sort of inclusive design, um, it's often quite sort of like the way things are often quite accepted until you get into sort of maybe doing a course about it. But perhaps it needs to be something that's more integrated into education instead of something that's accepted, because that's when it starts becoming. Um, not so inclusive i think when it's yeah. not critiquing it and we're not asking questions about it and asking why they're not enough public toilets why are those curbs um not allowing a pram to um go on um it's just very like sort of little things that are big parts of everyone's day um yeah yeah certainly and i think um there's potentially and an just stigma within architecture that it's almost kind of elitist in a sense there's a small cohort of decision makers that make these um choices about how we should live in our cities and i think that's where architecture has a long way to go you know in terms of um as soon as you have a select group of people making decisions about design and the city then that's um automatically when um you kind of exclude the potential for completely inclusive design you know and going back to that point of you know feminism is inherently inclusive and that's that's um the only way we can then end up making our cities and spaces you know safe and accessible to everyone yeah definitely yeah. that was one of the um interview questions wasn't it um I think they asked like um what is the importance of diversity in the workplace and 
think mm. particularly like from an architecture perspective like when you're designing these spaces quite often you think about how you yourself would experience this space and um that's very different if you're a man or if you're a female or if you're a wheelchair user if you've got children um so yeah so i think it's quite obvious that um diversity um in architecture in the people that are making these design design decisions is like very important and to be able to kind of integrate all that and make it a safe space for everybody you need people from all different aspects of life having an input on that um, yeah yeah because i guess you um subconsciously as designers you design for yourself and your own needs whether that's intentional or not and i think in um lots of industries it's really interesting and so um research as well so for example within it's like a really kind of rogue tangent within like the bird watching community and um the study of birds you know the all the research that has been done there because it has been such a male dominated um research group in a sense over time um it means the majority of research done has all been about male bird species and only lately since there have been more women involved in this research has um it come to light that there is hardly any kind of solid research on like female bird species and i think that um really is applicable to um say architecture in the built environment as well you know if men are designing cities or the primary decision makers then that these places are inherently going to be designed for men as well whether that's intentional or not and i think that's where the glass ceiling kind of comes into it even though um there may be um an awful lot of women within architecture it's these kind of decision making roles where women are lacking i think only 10 out of the top 100 um firms in the world within architecture have women in position of like ceo or like decision making roles and it's that glass ceiling where women may don't maybe don't feel like they have a place to step up to these you know really kind of critical important roles that um that's where you get these major discrepancies within industry and then that feeds through into the uh, physical built environments in a sense yeah and almost if the, a place is there for them and if again it's sort of like everyone's it's it's not um necessarily a women's sort of problem to try and get themselves there it's actually why is the system not allowing uh more women in that in that space um uh which is sort of everyone's sort of responsibility and yeah. yeah for sure and little things down to say experiences that i've had in architecture firms like small ones where they have been all men just little things like doing experience and there are no sanitary bins and toilets lots of as amy was used before um lots of little things that can make you feel like this this space and this place isn't for you yeah so. So true. and often the argument of like oh equality is it's done now because um uh, there's more women on our course than men or or the percentage is quite even like that's um it doesn't stop there and and if you just to keep quoting that argument that's that's not helpful or beneficial to the to having greater diversity in design um yeah we it can't stop yeah i mean it is a bit of like a weird one because i'm almost expecting like as i start an actual working job that i will kind of face more of these barriers like i feel like up until this point there's not been so much like our degree is um pretty inclusive i would say like there could be more diversity amongst like teaching staff i suppose and even amongst like students as well like we are predominantly a white cohort aren't we so but yeah like personally up until this point like i haven't faced any necessarily significant barriers so but it's something that i'm like expecting i will at some point but yeah i don't know it's a bit of a weird thing to be like expecting um that you're gonna have more hardship because you're female but yeah but i also think 
you know, as Alison pointed out before, we, we are also in such a position of privilege um, as white able-bodied women. Yeah. Um, I think if anything that gives us more more of a responsibility to you know really drive for inclusive and feminist architectural principles within education and then in industry and that's why I think things like the Women in Property Awards and you know younger students engaging in things like Feminist Week it has to come from the ground up because in 10-20 years you know this cohort of people, our year groups, we are then going to be the people in the industry that we currently criticise for not being inclusive enough and for not following a feminist agenda. Or, um, you know, I think that's why I think it's great to see it. just seeing who's attending these talks, you know, predominantly undergraduate students. Um, I think we should really encourage that and like continue on not just throughout this week but especially the guys like engaging in um this narrative of like talking to your peers and talking to the other students about um challenges that we face or challenges that we don't face and how we can help our peers in the challenges that they might face but we don't yeah i totally agree and also having those conversations both in terms of challenges of um like of the course and industry but also uh, in terms of the built environment but also like our actual a uh, women's experience or of the of the built environment and um, because everyone's experience of of a city is not the same and it isn't equal and um the city does prioritize um well it excludes um some people over others due to the way things have been designed um and i think there's important conversations about about that to be sort of to had and, and and have that when you're doing your um, projects and um, be open about that because like, yeah this is not just a conversation for women or um, sort of marginalized genders and marginalized groups to have it's for everyone because um, that's how it is fixed <laughs> yeah certainly um, and guys just as a reminder to continue to add your ideas onto the mirror board as well if you've got any questions as well um i just popped in there you know um two amazing um female icons that i really admire um uh, jane jacobs which i'm sure everyone has heard of and also leslie ken um who we she's i'm currently reading her feminist city which is a fantastic book i recommend every everyone to read it and i think it um really picks up on what alison was saying before about how um lots of subtle ways the way that cities are designed around um men can really have an um influence in the day-to-day -day life of women so just things like for example um it's more common for women to have so a more complicated commute to work in the morning because they may have to drop off their kids at school um, drop off another child at nursery then go to work then on the way back have to go via the shops to get um, food for the family and, and um, kind of these habitual day-to-day -day, um, trends which mean commuter routes are a lot more disjointed say for example even in Sheffield public transport routes um, everything stems from the city and spreads out in kind of straight lines out to the suburbs whereas say if you are a woman that is having to go to kind of multiple different um, places on your way to work these public transport routes are so inconvenient um, which say that the average commuter route for a man might just be from house to work, work to house. Um, they might not necessarily understand the uh, difficulties in navigating a city when the tools aren't there for 
to to help you navigate that space. Um, if anyone's got any other interesting, oh yeah, great photograph put in there by I'm not too sure who, but um, keep sending in like precedents and interesting books or um, pieces of writing that could inspire you know a conversation. And if anyone has any personal experiences that they want to share, um, please feel free to like turn your mic on and engage in the in the conversation. Could I also talk about sort of the recent movements of um, sort of our bodies, our streets and things like that? Because I think that could be a relevant thing to talk about in terms of um, um, sort of male violence and subsequent women's safety, uh, both um, sort, of at, sort of experiencing the city at night and after dark. I think often as um, in our courses, I think we're always told, oh, make sure you show what your project looks like in the night time or something. But so, and that you'd like quickly do it and show it and like do your Photoshop and make it darker. But you don't actually realise what it's like. And oh, because you, I don't know, you just, we don't put enough thought towards it. Um, so uh, yeah, I think this idea of designing um, safer spaces after dark is something that isn't really spoken about enough and needs to be um so there's like projects such as our bodies our streets uh in sheffield which is working to try and sort of get a, a lighting intervention in one of the cooks parks just to demonstrate actually although we say sheffield is a very green uh city and it's restorative and well-being with all the parks why when it comes after dark like 4 p.m in the winter those become no-go spaces yet yeah, that's quite accepted and um so our bodies our streets did a petition you may have seen it um four thousand people signed it to light up the parks and the council's response was um can you walk in pairs um and all the time it's like the women women need to modify their behavior um in order to fit into a city that's not designed for them um and it, it, you might think it's something little but it's really big and and it's too widely accepted um and the, the answer was also, oh, we don't have enough funding. But it's like, why don't you have enough funding when it's affecting 50% of your population? I think it's not always a question about funding. It's a question about what priorities the people at the top have, um, which is, that's just life, isn't it? Um, and I just want to comment on, sorry, I'm talking a lot, but you, with the um, devastating uh, murder of Sarah Everard recently, this has become quite into focus in terms of um, male violence, women's safety um, and public se sexual harassment in the built environment. Um, so the government uh, the other day, I think, um, released saying they were going to pledge £25 million for sort of new safety measures. And these new safety measures were lighting and CCTV. Um, and it's, it's this idea of actually it's not being thought about, like what makes you feel safe at night it's not necessarily more cameras if anything that's just encouraging a police state um and it's this idea have they consulted women's group ha women's groups have they consulted um sort of women who are at the who are architects landscape architects planners um to say actually does a flood lit park make you feel safe not necessarily um uh, what does make you feel safe is perhaps natural surveillance, more windows, more people around, um, uh, thresholds which you can see through and you're not sort of blocked off, you can see sight lines and it's that sort of consultation with um, a wider diversity of people who need to be designing spaces um, that needs to happen rather than these knee-jerk responses responses of oh we're going to give 25 million pounds and the problem's going to be fixed and I think actually um, whatever position you're in like student or whatever um we have a responsibility to say that architects and landscape architects need to do more to ensure that um these spaces feel safer obviously i'm only talking about the infrastructural change here there needs to be systemic change in terms of the culture of public sexual harassment and misogyny at which all everyone has to have those conversations with your friends uh talk to you, your friends about it call call out bad behavior when it happens 
because it's part of a women's every day um which is just mad that that continues to be accepted so yeah i'm just going off on things um no yeah, certainly yeah. this conversation needs to be had no i i agree with that and i think one thing with um within our education as architect students landscape architect students um architectural engineering is we're really encouraged in our designs to understand our client base and who we're designing for um i think that is really encouraged do you two think that um like a feminist agenda a feminist agenda and a um and focusing on inclusivity is kind of really enforced when it comes to conversations with tutors about our designs would you think it's a lot more surface level in terms of understanding your user group all about the sun path diagrams isn't it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean yeah at the moment when we're coming up with our projects we come up with the user groups as well don't we in that and um it's almost like not real life scenarios that we're coming up with whereas like when i guess it's a chance for creativity but like when it comes to the real world like we're designing for the like majority population of people aren't we and yeah i think we could definitely have more input i i think yeah there is that kind of it's obvious because we've experienced like being part of the the major population um so we don't necessarily get taught on that because it might seem a bit more um it's stating the obvious but i think there's a lot that needs to be said that hasn't been said that i feel like i still need to learn about and not um been taught about um yeah. yeah because i think one thing that we've been discussing within um you know kind of the role of feminist week um these discussions are really valid and really important but how could we um make these um, feminist and inclusive agendas more of a day-to-day -day conversation within studio with other with uh, with our tutors um to make it um an awful lot more normalized to always be thinking about feminism always be thinking about inclusivity um rather than just having like a token feminist week and i think that's what we've been really careful not to do you know we don't want this we as to us we don't want to say right here's our feminist week we've done our job tick the box now we're now we're like a feminist society it doesn't work like that so i think um as members of like societies and as students we certainly have like a responsibility to um make sure everyone's having these conversations all the time i think yeah definitely i think just what both of you have just said i think we have to be careful not to um make it a performative thing a lot of the time and that's so easy to do and you think oh yeah i'm choosing um i don't know a minority or potentially vulnerable group for my brief and i'm gonna design for them uh, and we may google about a situation and try and research as much as much as we can which is really good um but it's just important to make that as part of your life the whole time and um have that conversation about how people experience spaces because it's always going to be different from you um and i don't know whether the school needs to perhaps do more in terms of actually um uh, i don't know not making it a performative thing or just sticking it onto a project and actually having a real education or it's quite hard with COVID, isn't it? Because you sort of just want to walk with someone and see how they experience things or have more sort of workshops or consultations about about what someone would like from a city. Um, and, then, and there's also ethics around that and people need to be like properly paid and things like that. It can't just be a, a, an emotional, uh, we're taking their emotional la labour a lot of the time. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm dancing around points here. Uh, but I think just keep being critical about uh, what you're learning and how you're learning it and who's teaching you and where you're getting your resources from and check yourself and you think, what am I, what am I designing here and why? Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. No, yeah, and I think that's a really 
good point to kind of pause and um, maybe introduce if anyone has any questions for us and um, maybe taking it back to, yeah, all these thoughts and discussions that we've been having, the three of us, um, over the past, you know, couple of weeks since Women in Property. I think um, the, the process has been really poignant in bringing us together as three students where maybe we wouldn't have ordinarily had these conversations with each other, which goes back to this kind of solidarity with women, for women and with, I guess, so I guess, yeah, if anyone has any questions and uh, wants to ask us a bit more about anything or just generally want to share their ideas, um, continue adding to the um, mirror board as well. And feel free to turn on your mics if anyone has any questions. I'm just going to add lots to the Miro board because there's so many resources to look at. Perfect. Oh, um, I have a question about the like the women in um, construction. What was it called? I can't remember. Women in property. Yeah, women in property. Um, did they like give you any like advice for kind of how to navigate? um the industry um maybe like as a woman that would be different from normal or anything useful anyway <laughs> i think um they were very much so like um you know stick to your guns like do do not hide in the corner of the room if you're the only woman in the room and they often found that um sometimes being the only woman in the room almost played to their advantage because it meant that um you know their name was remembered and their face was remembered because they were a minority in a room in a sense and i think one that's a very kind of lucky privileged position that their anecdotes kind of tell but that's kind of what i got from them you know they were all very strong-willed women that were very sure of themselves and I found that was very inspiring. What about you guys? Yeah, I think it's worth saying as well, like once you're in practice, like anyone can join this organization. I think there's like a member fee, but then yeah, but then you're part of this network. So it's definitely something that you should look into when you're in practice. Um, yeah, just kind of building up that network of other people with shared or different experiences being females in the environment um but yeah so that's for everyone join that <laughs> one thing that i had a slight issue with was i mean we were all nominated by our white male head of year and then that was then coordinated by the second year white male deputy head of year um those kind of discrepancies i thought um was interesting i don't know if it quite follows the kind of uh feminist principles i still don't know why we were nominated anyway but um but um yeah i thought that was interesting potentially slightly hypocritical um, yeah <laughs> i agree <laughs> Um, slightly hypocritical and also not massively self-aware um, in sort of being like, oh yeah, let's just, oh, I feel like there's a lot of people in this school so I can't say things, but um, no, yeah, it's Bill. <laughs> it just goes into a, a quite a performative thing, like, oh yeah, look, we can nominate some people and, and we can, it looks like we've got women in our course who are, you know, I don't know, but it's not the most empowering thing in that way. I think the most empowering thing is sort of conversations like this and, and in solidarity with, um, uh, yeah, like all of us, uh, rather than having it as like, it shouldn't be in the realm of awards to sort of make equality happen, or it should be very much more of a um, inclusive <laughs> thing, like be inclusive about the way you do it. If you're, if you want something to be inclusive, then the process has to be. And it was 
to me exclusive yeah. yeah sorry and even just in the way that like i didn't know what women in property was before any of this process like why aren't they talked about anyway in them um, in all of our groups well, like why yeah. weren't, why wasn't everyone aware this was a thing yeah and aware that that resource is there and that connection is there yeah. and that um sort of mobility to um have that advice and um learn from each other um yeah. instead of us finding out about it through a sort of a backwards route yeah yeah agreed oh this is um, all <laughs> <laughs> i think alice has just put a really interesting um question there about um I'll read it out. Do you think there's a thing about embodying more masculine traits of assertiveness um, in order to do well in a profession dominated by men? Um, yeah, completely. Um, I don't know if Alice, you want to expand on that a bit more? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, can you hear me? What? Yeah. Um, yeah. I just, I was thinking about like how we make spaces for like smaller voices as well. Um, and making sure that we're not just like embodying like, um, you know, those traits that are possibly quite um, detrimental to other people in the studio and other people in the profession. And I don't, yeah, and like, you know, things that benefit some women and some men also benefit women. I don't know, it was just an interesting point, I guess, about like, where it said there's a difference between like feminist practice and feminist values and being a woman. Um, yeah. Certainly, and I think that's one thing we picked up um, with the uh, recording of the podcast with the EDI group. You know, there's often, you know, within our such studio and, you know, kind of exhibitions, it's who's got the loudest voice in the room. And that, that does not, if you've got the loudest voice in the room, that does not mean you're the best designer or you're the best architect. And I think that's certainly something that, you know, um, we we should pick up on more i think it's very easy for as you know as kind of like strong world women to have these conversations but there are you know an awful lot of people that still don't necessarily feel like they want to or need to share their voice in such like a loud assertive way in order to get heard you know and i guess it's just about being like really like self-aware of that and you yeah know, as you all move through the profession like make sure making sure that we make spaces for people with smaller voices i guess and you know yeah carry on sure. doing that and i think i've found just using platforms like Miro, where you can anonymous anonymously kind of share your ideas without having to you know stand up in the middle of the well in front of like 50 of the people you know i think now that platforms have kind of moved more digitally it certainly has given a space to people who may not ordinarily feel like they can share their voice in the way that would normally happen in real life i guess Does anyone else have any questions or any ideas they want to share? Thank you for that input, Alice, by the way, that was really, really valuable. Thanks for the event, though. It's good, good to hear you talk about it. Cheers. So I guess um, if anyone wants to add anything else or um, keep sharing on the Miro board and um, Amy or Alison, do you want to talk about anything else before we make it a wrap? I'm sure I'll think of loads of things afterwards. But... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should have said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I probably will too. But um, just to keep having more conversations like this, because you learn from each other and um, not it's not a homogenous thing. We don't all experience things the same. Literally what Alice said, like, um often you feel like I don't know like you have to be a louder voice or like have to be more eloquent or more confident and to get your views across which is not it's not a feminist way of doing um that's not a feminist value in a way um 
so yeah just to keep having conversations because i feel like we learn from each other um when we have that even if you think you know you, you don't <laughs> um you'll always learn through um like learning from other people's experiences and that's which something that lectures can't give you um it can't give you that um sort of like tacit experience yeah so yeah oh no go i was on. just gonna say i've learned so much from this talk even now like i'm gonna go into studio tomorrow and like relook at my design <laughs> think about it like again and like challenge myself on it and then yeah maybe even my peers in studio will be like but if you're a woman how does that make you feel <laughs> if you've got a wheelchair <laughs> yeah, yeah no, i think it's nice to kind of take these ideas from something like this and you know consider them within you know our, our designs as like young architecture students i think yeah but um so sorry <laughs> Shameless that, thing. uh there's an su elections going on today close at 5 p.m please vote uh for whoever you wish to vote for there's some amazing candidates there's also um a new position of a liberations officer which used to be women's officer but uh it was still taking on the women's officer was almost a liberations officer but under that name so that there, there's been a new sort of referendum to have the liberations officer as well as having part-time officers from uh liberation groups which you can vote for later but have a look at people's manifestos have a look who's representing you and who's standing up for you and i recommend and vote for alison i am <laughs> i am in it but also <laughs> you can choose whoever you wish if you want to vote for me you can <laughs> and have have a look um i'm not going for liberations i'm going uh first year president just because i think students deserve better and you need to, need to be treated better um but yeah take a look 5 p.m it closes yeah i think that's a you know all links back into you know as students you know kind of um ha having um a, a voice and a say in um our education and how we feel like our education should be shaped which i think is very relevant um at the moment with um the voting going on and also feminist week within um suas so um yeah thank you so much everyone for um you know coming today it's been i mean i've really enjoyed it i hope you guys have too and um oh thank you and um, please continue to come to the events throughout the week. We've got um, Harrison String Fellow, a uh, uh, female um, architecture firm based in Liverpool, talking tomorrow evening for us. They're a really great firm. And then we've got um, Nika Schalk talking on Friday for us. We've also got a film night on uh, Saturday, um, hosted by the EDI Action Group. Um, we're going to be watching Lovers Rock as part of the Small Axe series. Fantastic film um, series. I'd recommend you also watch it. And then finishing off the week with um, the podcast release with Matriarch. Uh, that was with um, Alison, Rosa and Will. So we've got some uh, great things coming up. Please keep adding to the Neuro Board and sharing your ideas. And um, yeah, it's been it's been great. So thank you so much, guys. Cheers. Thank you so much, Anna. Oh no, thank you. It was fun <laughs> talking to you all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you guys. Right. See you later.